Over C, Enter Stone, Day 6. Chapter 12. It took Barney a long time to make his way down the hill, past the house. There had been no sign of Great Uncle Mary on the headland. On the road, knots of wandering people were scattered, maddening about in his path. And three times he had to stand beside a, as a car came, grinding up the steep, narrow slope. Barney dodged impatiently to and fro, in and out, with Rufus at his heels. Halfway down the hill, he heard music from the other side of the harbor. And through the heads, he caught sight of the dancing procession moving forward along the quay. Slipping his finger inside Rufus's collar, he sidestepped through the thickening crowd and down the hill as fast as he could, darting through every visible gap like a shrimp in a pool. When he, when he reached the corner of the harbor, the procession was upon him, and he could see nothing at all but an impenetrable wall of legs and backs. He wriggled through behind them, the din of the music thumping in his ears, until he was out of the crowd at last and on the quay. With a sigh of relief, he let go of Rufus's collar and ran with him towards the deserted corner where he had arranged to meet Simon and Jane. There was nobody there. Barney looked round wildly. He could see nothing to give him the slightest idea of where, the slightest hint of where the others had gone. Reasoning with himself, he decided they must have caught sight of Mrs. Pock. She had been very keen on the idea of the carnival and the dancing. She must be in the procession. And it had been Simon and J Simon's and Jane's job to go and find her, as it had been his to go and scout on the headland. They must have gone chasing her, knowing that he would guess where they had gone. Satisfied, Barney went off to find the carnival. He followed the last of the crowd still drifting up the road. Even down in the sheltered harbor, the wind was blowing in from the sea. But now and again it dropped for a moment, and Barney heard a tantalizing snatch of music come wafting over the roofs from somewhere in the village. Pom, pom, de pom, pom, pom. All around him, people were wandering aimlessly about, idly talking. Where they, where they've gone? We, <clears throat> we can meet them at the ground, but they, they danced through the streets for ages yet. Oh, come on! Disregarding them, Barney set off down a little side, turning with Rufus still loping patiently at his heels. He wandered from one winding lane into another, down narrow passages where the slate roofs almost touched overhead, past neat front doors with the brass knockers gleaming golden in the sun through the cobbled alleys where front doors opened not onto pavement, but straight onto the street. For a small place, Truisic seemed to be in an extraordinary, endless maze of winding little roads. Straining his ears all the time, Barney followed the sound of the music through the maze. He made one or two false turns, losing the sound. Then gradually the band grew louder, and with it he began to hear the hum of voices and the rasping shuffle of feet. He snapped his fingers to Rufus and broke into a trot swinging from one quiet, deserted little alley into the next, and then suddenly the noise burst on him like a storm, and he was out of the muffling, narrow street and among the crowds, out in the sunshine, filling a bro broad road where the procession jogged and danced by. Come on, my white-headed boy, someone called to him, and the people nearby turned and laughed. Barney could not see Simon and Jane amongst the dancers, and there seemed little chance of being able to get to them, even if he did. He gazed fascinated around him at the bobbing giant heads, the bodies beneath them fantastic and gay in doubles and red, yellow, blue hose. Everywhere he saw costumed figures, a man dancing stiff as a tree, a solid flapping mass of green leaves, pirates, sailors, a hussar in bright red with a tall cap, slave girls, jesters, a man in a long blue silk gown made as a pantomime dame, a girl all in black, twirling sinuous as a cat with a cat's bewhiskered head, Little boys in green as Robin Hood, little girls with long fair hair as Alice, highwaymen, Morris men, flower sellers, gnomes. It was like some, nothing he had ever seen before. The dancer whirled in and out of the crowd on the edge of the street where he stood, and then suddenly before Barney knew what was happening, they were dancing round him. He felt someone catch at his hand, and he was drawn out into the center of the dancing crowd among the ribbons and feathers and bright bobbing heads so that his feet fell into step with the rest. Breathless, grinning, he glanced up. The black-gloved hand holding one of his own belonged to the figure of the cat, twirling in the skin close black tights with a long black tail swinging out behind, and the whiskers and whiskers bristling long and straight from the head mask fitting over the cheeks. He saw the eyes glint through the slits and the teeth flash. For a moment among the dancers, dancing figures all around, he saw close to him one in great feathered red Indian headdress, with a face startling like Mrs. Polk's. But as he opened his mouth to call, the black cat seized both his hands and wheeled him round and round in a dizzy spiral through the ranks of the crowd. People glanced down at him and smiled as he passed, and Barney, giddy with the music and the speed and the twisting black limbs of the cat before his eyes, flung himself laughing round where it swung him, until he came up with a sudden halt against the long white robes of a figure dressed as an Arab sheik. 
moving with the rest so that the robes were swung wide and billowing by the breeze. And glancing up through a world swaying with his own giddiness, Barney had time only to glimpse a slim figure and a dark-skinned, lean face, before the cat swung him by the hand straight into the outswung, muffling folds of the man's white robes. The robe twisted round him as he staggered, still laughing in the sun gloom, and then so quickly that he had no time even to feel alarm, the man's arm came down round him like an iron band and lifted him from the ground, and the other hand muffled his mouth in the folds of the cloth, and Barney felt himself being carried away. Before he could struggle, he was swung in a scuffling moment through the roaring music in the crowd. Pushing ineffectually against the man's chest, he felt him run a few steps and heard the noise of, vo and the vo of the voices in the band suddenly grow fainter. He kicked out blindly and felt his toes hit the man's shins, but he was only wearing sandals and he could do no great harm. The man gave a muffled curse but did not pause, jolting him along for a few more steps until Barney felt himself swung higher into the air and dropped on a to a padded seat that protested with the noise of springs. The rope fell loose from his mouth, he yelled, and went on yelling until a hand came back and pressed hard against his face. A girl's voice said urgently, Quickly, get him away! A voice almost as light as a girl's, but masculine, said curtly, Get in, you'll have to drive. Barney suddenly lay quite still. All his senses altered. There was something familiar about the second voice. He felt a coldness at the back of his neck. Then the pressure of the hand over his mouth relaxed a little through the cotton folds, and the voice said softly close to his ear, Don't make a noise, Barnabas. And don't move, and nobody will be hurt. And suddenly Barney knew the black-masked figure of the cat and the dark man in Sheik's robes. He felt the seat shudder slightly as the noise of a powerful car's engine coughed and then rose in a throbbing howl. Then the note deepened and he felt a lurch and knew that he was being driven away. Rufus jumped nervously back from the shuffling, dancing feet that enclosed Barney in the crowd. Tentatively, he put his nose forward to follow. Once, twice, but always a heel came up in, w in the way with an accidental kick, and he had to dodge away. From a safer distance, he barked loudly, but the sound was lost at once in the booming music and the clamor of the crowd. Alarmed by the shattering noise and bustle suddenly filling his small world, he put his ears back flat against the side of his head. His tail was down between his legs, and he showed the whites of his eyes. He retreated further from the noise, waiting hopefully on the corner of the street for Barney to reappear, but there was no sign of him. Rufus moved uneasily. Then as the band drew directly opposite, blowing and banging only a few yards away, rocking every corner with the rise and fall of music that, to a dog's ears, was a menacing, roaring noise, Rufus could suddenly stand it no longer. He gave up all hope of Barney, and turning his back at the clamor of the carnival, he padded away down the alley with the tip of his tail sweeping the ground and his nose lowered, sniffing his way home. Simon and Jane rejoined one another at the corner of the harbor, quiet again now in the sunny afternoon. Well, I've been back to where we sat. He isn't there. I had a good look in the house. He hasn't been there either. Do you think he could have gone off with Mrs. Pock? I keep telling you, it couldn't have been Mrs. Pock you saw. I don't see why not. If only you hadn't stopped me, I could have grabbed her. How could we meet Barney if here if you... Simon began, oh, all right, all right, but we haven't met him. Well, then, he can't have come down from the headland yet. Jane's expression changed. Oh, dear, perhaps he's got into trouble up there. No, no, don't worry when we don't need to. More like he's gone. He's found Great Uncle Mary after all, and they're both up there still. Well, come on, then. Let's go and look. The car swayed and growled, as it were alive. Barney lay wrapped up like a parcel in the robe which Mr. Withers had slipped from his own shoulders as he dropped him in the car. He decided that it must be a sheet. The smell of it under his nose was like clean laundry on the beds at home. But he wasn't at home. He muttered peevishly under his breath and kicked at the side of the car. Now, now, said Mr. Withers. He took hold of Barney's legs and swung him none too gently round into a sitting position at the same time, pulling the sheet clear of his face. I think perhaps we might let you emerge now, Barnabas. Barney blinked, dazzled, dazzled by the sudden sunlight. Before he could open his eyes properly to look at the road, the car swung squealing through a gap in a high wall and slowed down, its wheels crunching on gravel along a tree-lined drive. Nearly there, Mr. Wheeler said placidly. Barney twisted his head to glare up at him. He could still barely recognize Mr. Wither's face through the dark brown stain that turned him into an Arab. The eyes and teeth glinted unnaturally white, and behind the makeup man seemed withdrawn and pleased with himself, almost arrogant. Where are we? Where are you taking me? Don't you know? Ah, no, the dark headed nodded wisely. Of course you would not. Well, you will know soon, Barnabas. What do you want? Barney demanded. Want? Nothing, my dear boy. We're just taking you for a, for a little ride, to meet a friend of ours. I think you'll get on very well together. Barney saw through the trees that they were coming to a house. He looked down at the sheets 
still twi twined round him and wriggled to move his arms free. Mr. Withers turned quickly. Take this stupid thing off me. I feel silly. Just a little joke of ours, Mr. Withers said. Where's your sense of humor, Barnabas? I thought you were enjoying yourself. He leaned over and began pulling the sheet free as the car drew up outside the peeling front door of a big, deserted-looking house. You'll have to hop out if you can. I can't loosen it properly in here. He spoke casually, easily, with no trace of menace in his voice, and as Barney glanced up at him, suspiciously, the white teeth shone briefly again in a smile. The girl slipped out of the driving seat, moving with a, like a snake in her black tights, and came round to open the door at Barney's side. She helped him out and spun him round to pull the sheet away. Barney staggered, his arms and legs so stiff with cramp that he could hardly move. Polly Withers laughed. Her head was still a fantastic sight in those close-fitting black cat's mask, covering all her face but the eyes and mouth. I'm sorry, Barney, she said companionably. We did overdo it a bit, didn't we? You danced jolly well, I thought. I was almost sorry to stop. Still, never mind. Now we'll go and have some tea, if it isn't too early for you. I haven't had any lunch, Barney said irrelevantly. Suddenly remembering, well, in that case, we must certainly get you something to eat. Good gracious, no lunch, and it's all our fault, I expect. Norman, ring the bell. We must feed the poor boy. Mr. Withers, making a concerned clicking noise with his tongue, crossed from the car and pressed the bell next to the big door. <clears throat> he was all in white still, but in shirt sleeves and white flannels without his arid robe. His bare arms were stained the same dark brown as his face. Barney, following him slowly with the girl's hand resting lightly on his shoulder, was puzzled by their friendliness. He began to wonder whether he had been seeing everything in the wrong light. Perhaps this was, after all, only a joke, part of the fun of Carnival Day. Perhaps the Witherses were perfectly ordinary people after all. They had never actually done anything to prove beyond doubt that they were the enemy. Perhaps he and Simon and Jane had got things all wrong. Then he heard footsteps echoing faintly within the house, clumping gradually nearer, and the door was open. At first he did not recognize the figure in tight black jeans and a green shirt. Then he saw that it was the boy Bill Hoover, who had chased Simon, for the map. And in a moment he remembered the scene on Kamar had that day and the greed on Miss Withers' face when she had looked at the map, and he knew that they had not been wrong after all. Bill's face lit up out of his downturned sol sullenness as he saw Barney, and he grinned across at Miss Withers. He got him then, he said. Mr. Withers cut in quickly, stepping forward and almost pushing the boy out of the way. Hello, Bill, he said smoothly. We've brought a fr young friend of ours on a visit. I don't think anyone will mind. We could all do with something to eat. Run and see if you can manage to rustle anything up, will you? Mine, the boy said. I should say not. He looked at Barney again with the same eager, unpleasant grin, then turned and disappeared, and disappeared down the long corridor, calling something into an open doorway as he passed. C come along in, come on along in, Barney, the girl said. She propelled him gently through the door and shut it behind her. Barney looked round him in the long, empty passage at the marks of damp on the fading wallpaper, and f he felt very small and lonely. He heard a deep voice call from somewhere inside the house. Withers, is that you? Mr. Withers, who had been standing surveying Barney with a slight smile, jumped and put his hand half consciously up to his collar. Come, he said curtly. He took Barney by the hand and led him down the corridor, their footsteps echoing on the uncarpeted wooden floor, to the doorway of a room at the far end. It was a big room, dark with bla the blazing sunlight outside. Long windows stretched from floor to ceiling in one wall with long, shabby velvet curtains half pulled across, and the light that shafted in between them fell on a big square desk in the center of the room, its top littered with papers and books. The room seemed empty. Then Barney jumped as he saw a tall man move in the shadow beyond the sunlight. Ah, said the deep voice, I see you have brought the youngest of them, the white-haired child. I am all, I am most interested to make his acquaintance. How do you do, Barnabas? He held out his hand, and Barney, bemused, took it. The voice was not pleasant, and rather kind. How do you do, he said faintly. He looked up at the tall man, but in the half-light he had only a vague impression of, of deep-shadowed eyes under dark, heavy brows and a clean-shaven face. The smooth, smooth edge of a silk jacket brushed his hand. I was about to have a cool drink, Barnabas, the man said, as courteously as if he were talking to someone older than himself. Will you join me? He waved his hand towards the shadows, and Barney saw the glint of silver and white cloth on a low table behind the desk. The boy has had nothing to eat, sir, Miss Wither said behind Barney in a peculiarly hushed, reverent voice. We thought perhaps Bill could fetch something. Her voice died away. The man looked at her and grunted. Very well, very well, Polly. For goodness sake, go and change into some normal clothes. You look ridiculous. The necessity for fancy dress is over, and you are not at the carnival now. He spoke sharply, and Barney was astonished at the meekness 
with which Miss Withers answered him. Yes, sir, of course. She slipped away into the passage, sleek and inhuman, in the black skin's cut, black cat skin. Come on in, my boy, and sit down. He spoke softly again, and Barney came slowly forward into the room and sat down in an armchair. It creaked with the crackling rustle of wicker work, and he suddenly felt for an instant that he might, or he had, that he had been in the room before. He glanced round, his eyes growing accustomed to the dim light of the dark walls and the shelves of books rising to the ceiling. There was something. He could... He could not place it. Perhaps it was just that the room reminded him a little of the gray house. As if he read his thoughts, the man said, I hear you are on holiday in the gray house, above the harbor. Barney said, surprised at his own daring. It must be a very interesting house. That seems to be the only thing anyone ever says to us. The man leaned forward, resting his hand on the edge of the desk. Oh, the deep voice rose a little with eagerness. Who else has asked you about it? Oh, no one important, Barney said hastily. After all, it's a nice house. Do you live here, mister? My name is Hastings, the big man said, and at the sound of the name, Barney again felt the flicker of familiarity vanishing as soon as it came. Yes, I do. This is my house. Do you like it, Barnabas? It's rather like the gray house, as a matter of fact, Barney said. The man turned back towards him again. Indeed. Now, what makes you say that? Well, Barney began, but then the door opened again. And the boy, Bill, came in carrying an enormous tray with a big jug of milk and some bottles of lager, <clears throat> glasses, and a plate piled high, or piled with sandwiches. He crossed the room to where the tall man stood and put the tray down on the desk, nervously just within reach, as if he were frightening to come, frightened to come too near. Miss Withers said, for something to eat, sir, he said gruffly, already backing towards the door. The man waved him away without speaking. The sight of the sandwiches made Barney realize how long it was since breakfast, and he, and he felt more cheerful. He sat back in the creaking chair and glanced round him. It could have been worse, he thought. The mysterious Mr. Hastings seemed to be, mean him no harm, and he was beginning to enjoy the sight of all their enemies cringing in terror before someone else. He took a sandwich from the plate held out to him and bit into it cheerfully. The bread was soft and new, with, with, with plenty of butter, and in the middle... There was some delicious kind of potted meat. He began to feel better still. Mr. Withers moved silently across the desk and poured out a glass of milk and began opening the bottles of lager. The big man called Hastings sat down in the armchair behind the desk and swung gently from side to side, regarding Barney thoughtfully from beneath his heavy brows. He said softly, conversationally, Is it buried under the gray house, Barnabas, or one of the standing stones? Halfway through a gulp of milk, Barney suddenly choked. He groped for the desk and put his glass down on the bang and leaned forward, coughing and sputtering. Mr. Withers, soft-footed, crossed to pat him on the back. Dear me, Barnabas, he muttered. Has something gone down the wrong way? Barney, his, his mind working fiercely, went on coughing for rather longer than he needed to. When he looked up, he took refuge instinctively in innocence. I'm sorry, I caught my breath, he said. Did you say something? I think you heard perfectly well what I said, Mr. Hastings said. He stood up again, towering very tall over Barney in the low chair, and walked over to the window with a glass of lager in his hand. The light fell on his face for the first time in watching. Barney felt a slight chill of uneasiness at the flat, permanent scowl of the brows and the grim lines running down to the mouth. It was a strong, faraway face, something like his great uncle's, but with a frightening coldness behind it that was not like great uncle Mary at all. Barney found himself wishing very much that there was somebody to tell Great Uncle Mary where he had gone. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Hastings held up his glass to the window. The sunlight shone through it, clear and golden. An ordinary glass of beer, he said abstractedly, until he holds it against the light. And then it becomes quite transparent. You can see right through it. He swung around on Barney so that he was silhouetted dark and menacing against the window again. As transparent as every single thing that you children have been doing these past days. Do you think we have not seen through it all? Do you think we have not been watching? I don't know what you mean, Barney said. You may be a stupid little boy, Mr. Hastings said, but not, I think, as stupid as all that. Come along. We know that you have found a map, and that with the help of your esteemed great uncle, Professor Lyon, his mouth twisted on the words as if he were testing, tasting something unpleasant, you have been attempting to trace the place to which it leads. We know that you have come very near the end of that track. And since, my dear Barnabas, we cannot draw in, <clears throat> cannot afford to risk your reaching the end of it, we have decided at last to draw in the net and put a stop to your little quest. That is what you are doing here. 
Marty shivered at the menace in the cold, deep voice. His mouth felt very dry. He reached forward and picked up the glass of milk again and took a long drink. I'm sorry, he said, blinking wide-eyed at Mr. Hastings over the rim of his glass and licking a mustache of milk away from his upper lip. I don't know what you mean. Could I have another sandwich, please? Behind him, he heard Mrs. Withers, <clears throat> Mr. Withers' sharp, shocked intake of breath, and for a second a very small, deep voice deep inside his brain crowded with triumph. But he watched the tall figure by the window apprehensively. It seemed to grow for a moment and loom still more menacingly over him. And then it moved abrupt, abruptly back into the dim shadow of the rest of the room. Give him another sandwich, Mr. Hastings said, and then you can go, Withers. You know what you have to do. We haven't much time. Come back when I ring. Mr. Withers, his dark stained face scarcely visible in the gloom, pushed the plate of sandwiches across to Barney's elbow. He said obsequiously, Yes, sir, and duck, ducking his head in a bow, he went out of the room. Barney took another sandwich, feeling fantastically that whatever was likely to happen, he might as well eat. Why do they all call you sir, he said curiously. The tall man came and sat down at the desk again, playing with a pencil between his fingers. Who is there that you would call sir? Well, nobody really, only the masters at school. Perhaps I am one of their masters, Mr. Hastings said, but, but they aren't at school. I think you would not really understand, Barnabas. In fact, there are a great many things that you do not understand. I wonder what stories that great uncle of yours has put into your head. He has told you that we are bad and wicked, no doubt, and that he is a good man. Barney blinked at him and took another bite of his sandwich. Mr. Hastings smiled grimly. Ah, but of course you do not know what I'm talking about. You haven't the slightest idea. The heavy irony in the deep voice made Barney wrinkle his nose. Well, let us forget that just for a moment and pretend, just pretend, that you do know what I mean. You have to be led to believe, I think, that my friends and I are everything that is evil, that we want to follow up the clues in the map because we can do bad things with what we find. You have nothing to go on but your great uncle's word, and perhaps one or two strange things that Polly or Norman Withers may seem to have done. The voice dropped until it was silky and very gentle. Well, just think, Barnabas, of the strange things your great uncle does, coming out of nowhere and vanishing again. He has vanished again today, has he not? Well, no, of course you can't answer me, because we are only pretending that you know what I am talking about. But this is not the first time he has unexpectedly disappeared, I think, and it will not be the last. He stared at Barney, dark eyes penetrating level from beneath the overhanging brow. Barney ate his sandwich a little more slowly, unable to take his own gaze away. As far as our being evil? Well, now, Barnabas, do I strike you as being a bad man? Have I done you any harm? There he sat, eating and drinking, quite happily, certainly not looking alarmed. Are you frightened of me? You had kidnapped, had me kidnapped, Barney said flatly. Oh, come now, that was just a little joke of Polly's. I wanted to talk to you, that's all. Mr. Hastings sat back in his chair and spread his arms wide, with the tips of his fingers just touching the edge of the desk. Now look, my boy, I'll make a bargain with you. I will tell you what is actually behind everything that has been going on these last days, and you'll stop playing this game of not having seen the map. He did not wait for Barney to say anything. We are indeed hunting the same thing that your great uncle is hunting, my friends and I. But whatever story he has spun you about us is, quite frankly, a lot of moonshine. Your great uncle is a scholar and an outstanding one. Nobody would dispute that, and I probably know it better than you. The trouble is that he himself knows it and thinks about it too much. What do you mean? said Barney indignantly. When a man is famous for being a very great scholar, he wants very much to go on being famous. You found this old manuscript, you and your brother and, and sister, and when you told your great uncle about it, he realized, as you did not, how important it was. When he saw it, he was even more certain. Now I, Barnabas, am the curator, that means the director, of one of the most important museums in the world. I have been hunting the manuscript that you found, and especially what it leads to, for a very long time. They are both important to the people who study such things. It could make a lot of difference to the total knowledge where there is knowledge there is in the world, and your great uncle knew that I was hunting them. But when he found the manuscript, he saw that he had a chance of achieving the quest himself. The more he thought about this, the more attractive an idea it seemed. He has always been famous as a man who knows a great deal about the part of history these things are connected with. If he were to find them, he would know more than anyone else in the world. Perhaps, or sorry, people would say, what an amazing man Professor Lyon is. To, to know so much. There's no one like him anywhere. <clears throat> to know how much? Barney said. You would not understand the details, Mr. Hastings said shortly. 
Then his voice dropped again to the same deep, persuasive note. Don't you see, Barnabas? Your great uncle is concerned only with his own fame. Do you think for one moment that when you have ended the hunt, any of the credits will go to you, children? It will all go to him. Whereas I and my museum and the people I employ believe that all knowledge should be shared and that no man, one man, has the right to, to it alone. And if you were to help us, we should take care that you had whatever credit was due to you. The whole world should know what you had done. In spite of himself, Barney had forgotten his sandwich and mouth. He sat listening, troubled, trying to understand the truth for himself. Yes, Great Uncle Mary was strange, often, not like other men, but all the same. He said, slow and perplexed, Well, I don't know. All of this just doesn't sound like Great Uncle Mary. Surely he couldn't do anything like that. But I assure you, Mr. Hastings jumped to his feet and began walking to and fro between the desk and the door. He seemed unable to keep still any longer. Many people one knows well act. I do realize that you may be surprised and shocked. But this is the truth, Barnabas. It is very much more simple than you have been led to believe, Barney said. So we ought to give the map to you and let you find the... Just in time, he caught, caught back the word grail. Through the whole conversation, there had been no mention of what the map led to. Perhaps they knew less than they said they did. Perhaps that was one of the things that they wanted to trap him into telling them. Mr. Hasing paused for a second. Yes, he said. Well, and let you find whatever it leads to? Barney picked up the glass of milk again and drank reflectively. Because then you would put, put whatever it is in your museum, and everyone would be able to know about it. Mr. Hastings nodded gravely. There you have it, Barnabas. All knowledge is sacred, but it should not be secret. I think you understand. This is something you should do, that we should do, in the name of scholarship. Barney looked down into his milk, swishing it gently around the glass. But isn't that what Great Uncle Mary's doing? No, no, Mr. Hastings swung impatiently on his heel, striding impatient and very tall up and down the room. Whatever he does, is, he does, he is doing in the name of Professor Lyon, and that is all. What else would he do anything for? Barney never knew afterwards what put the words into his head. He spoke before he thought, almost as if, this, as if someone else were speaking through him. He heard him saying clearly, In the name of King Arthur and the old world before the dark came. The dark figure stopped abruptly completely still, with its back still turned. For a moment there was absolute silence in the room. It was as if Barney had pressed a switch that would at any moment bring an avalanche thundering down. He sat motionless and almost breathless in his chair. Then very slowly the figure turned. Barney gulped and felt a prickling at the roots of his hair. Mr. Hastings was at the darker end of the room near the door, and his face was hidden in the shadow. But he seemed to loom taller and more threatening than he had ever done before. And when he spoke, there was a different throb in the deep voice that paralyzed Barney with fright. You will find, Barnabas True, he said softly, that the dark will always come and always win. Barney said nothing. He felt as if he had forgotten how to speak, and his voice had died forever with his last words. Mr. Hastings did not take his eyes off him. He reached down out beside him and tugged twice at a cord hanging down from the ceiling beside the door. Within seconds, the door swung open, and Mr. Withers slipped noiselessly inside. He had washed the dark brown stain from his arms and face. Is everything ready? said the deep voice. Yes, sir, Mr. Withers hissed obsequiously. The car is at the side door. The girl has changed. She will drive again. You will drive with her. I shall follow in the closed car with the boy. Bill has it ready? The engine is running already. Where are you taking me? Barney's voice rose shrill in fright, and he jumped down from his chair. But he could not run out of the room past the tall figure that still held his gaze. You are coming with us to the sea, said the voice behind the dark, intent eyes. You will cause no trouble, and you will do whatever I say. And when we are on the sea, Barnabas, you are going to tell us about your map and show us where it leads.